It is a pleasure to welcome back to this program the best-selling author of No Logos and The Shock Doctrine, and now her latest, This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus Climate. Naomi Klein, uh, welcome back to the program. Great to be with you, Sam. Now, uh, now, Naomi, I, I think the last time we actually saw you was, uh, we spoke, was was down at Zuccotti Park um, a couple years ago during the, the Occupy protests. Um, and uh, the uh, your book is is f- fantastic. and I, I, But I have a question for you that I, I don't think I, I, I ever ask any author. And, um, and, and I, I think... I'm not 100% sure why I'm asking it, but I'm going to ask anyways. Who is this book for? <laughs> I mean, because and I don't mean that in, I mean that insofar as um, the book is about climate change, but it's not, it, it takes as a given that this is real. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I, which, I mean, I think for most of the people listening to this program is, uh, something that we assume. But, I mean, who is this this book for? Well, um, I think it's a good question. Um, and, and and for me, it, it is always really important to think about who I'm writing for and how, um, and how my books can be used. Because, you know, I don't think writing political nonfiction, um, you know, is just something to do for fun or sport, you know, it's it, 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 for the kind of books I write, um, for them to matter, they need to be picked up by by movements, by social movements that sort of put them to work, you know, and I've been really lucky with my previous books, um, you know, No Logo um, had this great political timing where it was at the printer just when the protests against the World Trade Organization were happening in Seattle in 1999, and the Shock Doctrine came out um, just sort of before the financial collapse. And the Shock Doctrine was about how crises are, are used by our elites to consolidate wealth and pass the bill on to the public. So that book ended up being useful, you know, to to, to different social movements that were fighting austerity. And for this book, it was actually a really tough book to write because I wasn't sure exactly who was going to use the book. And you mentioned Zuccotti Park. You know, I come out of these movements for social and economic justice. That's, you know, that, that's, who's, that's who have used my books before. But I've really been struck by the fact that climate change um, has not been at the center of those, those, those movements. Uh, you know, Occupy um, is a movement that, that, that is concerned about environmental impacts and, you know, in the way it organizes. Um, but climate change was always a bit of a footnote when talking about the, you know, the, the problems of our economic system. You know, you make a list of all the things capitalism was, you know, was doing wrong, sending, you know, people, evicting people from their homes and, 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 and leading to crisis levels of inequality and sort student debt. Um, but, but, but often people would forget to mention, oh, and it's also destabilizing life on earth, this right. system built on short-term greed. And, and, and so the book is really an attempt to build a bridge between people who are focused more on issues of economic and political justice and uh, this whole discussion that's going on on climate change, because I think we are very siloed. And, 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 and that bridge goes both ways in some respects. I mean, I think that is the um, the, the the sort of the most frank point, it seems to me, in the book, which is, um, you know, here's a truth. That, well, you start off by by saying that the right is right. And explain what that means to people. Well, yeah, the first chapter of the book is is called "The Right Is Right," and 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 it's it's a book, uh, it's a it's a chapter that that is based on my time hanging out with climate change deniers at the Heartland Institute, um, and um, you know I don't believe that they're right about the science. So if, <laughs> let me be very clear about that. They are dead wrong about the science, and 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 we should definitely throw our lot in with 97 percent of active climate scientists who believe that 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 humans are are, are causing climate change. Um, but where they're right is this is a movement that is a product, really, entirely of 
the uh, conservative think tank movement. You know, the Heartland Institute is a so-called free market think tank. And if you go to their conferences, you know, it's, it's, it's all the familiar players. It's Cato, it's the American Enterprise Institute, it's Heritage. It's, you know, it's, it, it's just a kind of like reunion of all, of all these guys and turning their attention to climate and casting it as a socialist conspiracy. But what I find ta- in talking to climate change deniers is that they understand very clearly that if climate change is real, it's basically the end of their ideological project, um, because this is a project that is about vilifying all forms of collective action. Um, government is always the problem, never the solution. Um, it's, it's, it's a movement that venerates profit. You know, if we liberate the, uh, the profit-making impulse, uh, the greed impulse, and that will deliver the best uh, your possible outcomes for the most number of people. I mean, I don't need to summarize, you know, right-wing ideology for you. Um, but th- what they understand is that if climate change is real, if that economic system is in the process of destabilizing um, the planet's life support systems, then they have lost the argument. And they understand that so deeply that they have chosen to deny the science because accepting it would so shatter their worldview, which is why I find it so confounding, frankly, that so many people on the left um, and so many liberals don't talk about climate change all the time um, because because it does it does uh, uh, challenge that worldview fundamentally and it does create a framework where it becomes not just possible but necessary to argue for forceful investments in the public sphere for a new kind of collective action um, and um, for frankly different values to govern our societies um, other than just the pursuit of greed. Uh, you know, uh, what, what, what you ask that question, I mean, what is the answer? I mean, what is the answer as to, as to why, I mean, I can, as someone who, uh, you know, theory? does a daily show yeah. and, uh, you know, I pick different topics on every day and sort of like, you know, looming behind, of course, everything on some level is this notion that, oh, we're doing this all on borrowed time. Uh, and, you know, I've, uh, I've talked to, to Chris Hayes, and Chris Hayes has talked about it quite a bit, too, on his program, as to, you know, how, how, do you, how do you tell that story every day? And it's interesting because there are multiple elements about it that scare uh, the, the right-wingers. One, in that the implications of addressing uh, climate change, uh, both in terms of sort of in practice and in methodology, the idea that, society can respond to something is fundamentally an anathema to what they're Mm -hmm. doing in addition to what it would do. But I mean, why don't liberals talk about it more? Um, Well, look, uh, you know, I think, I I think part, I think there are many factors um, and it depends how we define liberals because and one of the things I argue in the book, and the reason the subtitle of the book is capitalism versus the climate, as opposed to just, you know, conservatism versus the climate, um, is that it isn't just a challenge to the sort of extreme right wing worldview. I mean, for them, it's just catastrophic, right? It means their whole sort of everything they believe falls apart. But most um, centrist liberals still believe, um, you know, are still pretty, pretty embedded in uh, at least a, a very Keynesian a growth model, right? So they still believe that, that we should have an economic system that's built on the pursuit of economic growth. They just differ on how we should distribute the gains from that growth, right? Um, they think there should be more investments in the public sphere. We should do more about poverty and so on, right? But the problem is we've procrastinated so long uh, in dealing with this crisis that now it clashes really fundamentally with a uh, an economic system that fetishizes uh, uh, growth above all else because we have to cut our emissions so rapidly now that we need to have a much more planned economy so we can grow some parts, but we have to contract other parts. Uh, and, and that is a challenge to a lot of liberals. It's a challenge to a lot of leftists, right? I mean, you know, look at a country, you know, like Bolivia, Venezuela, Ecuador, all the left-wing governments of Latin America still have an extractivist uh, economic plan at their center, dig up oil, dig up gas, export it, and redistribute it more equitably than their predecessors. Um, 
so we are all challenged by this. And, you know, this is why I tell a deeper story in the book that is really about the, the extractivist worldview and fundamentally fossil fuels that, you know, have allowed us to imagine that we are apart from nature. I mean, this is why in the book I, you know, I, I quote this, some, of, some of the sales manuals from the early uh, steam engines in the late 1700s, which you would think wouldn't be all that interesting, but I promise is actually scintillating stuff because what, they're, what they are saying, to, you know, to the fact owners um, and to you know the the, 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 the shipbuilders is this will free you from nature you will li- this will liberate you from nature you will no longer have to think about where the water flows and where the wind blows and you will be dominant um, at, for the first time ever and climate change is this is this belated response that says, really, you thought you were in charge? Well, I'll show you who's in charge, right? right. Um, not to overly anthropomorphize, but, you know, we, you know, all the while that we've been burning carbon, um, we have been contributing to the building up of this powerful response. So, it, you know, it, it is a, it is a, it's a, it's a challenge to all of us. It says, actually, you are part of nature, you human beings who imagined yourself to be above it. Um, so it requires all of us to dig, frankly. And, and so there's this sort of, um, uh, there, there are two sort of parallel problems that is sort of uh, are providing this inertia. One is that more, I guess, I don't know, intrinsic notion. Maybe it's not that intrinsic. I mean, you, and we'll get to uh, the blockadia and, and some of the indigenous um, activism that you write about. But we have one, I guess, maybe more intrinsic uh, to us culturally, this notion of conquering that you can actually conquer nature. And that is one sort of, I guess, a cultural problem that we have. And then another one, you write, comes in in uh, the, the, the 80s, early 80s, or uh, when we realize, okay, we've had this idea that we can conquer nature, but we're starting to get some indication that we can't. Yeah. And yeah. that happens at a very poor time in terms of our capacity to address it. Yeah, and I mean, there's there has always been a sort of dialectic where you know this idea that we're not in charge, you know, that's an, not an entirely new idea, and that was part of a sort of shift in consciousness that was happening in the in the 1960s and 70s, um, and you know, the publication of Silent Spring was a huge breakthrough in that, and you know, this was. You know, the theme, you know, people think of Silent Spring as just being about DDT, but it wasn't. It was about the mechanistic worldview that you could wage war on nature that Rachel Carson identified with this idea of sort of aerially bombarding um, plant life to try to get rid of a few pests and killing all kinds of other things in the process, right? It was about hubris fundamentally. And that was really taken on by the 60s counterculture and then this burgeoning environmental movement at that time. Um, but yeah, then came the 1980s. And the, the argument I make in, in, in the book is that climate change has suffered from a case of epic bad timing in that it landed on our laps at the worst possible moment. And that was 1988. That's the year that James Hansen testified on Capitol Hill that he now had this high, high degree of certainty that there was a connection between greenhouse gases and warming. Of course, scientists knew this long before, but this was, this was when it became our problem, right? This is when, you know, the editors of Time magazine put planet Earth on the cover and made it their man of the year and, you know, for, for, for 1988. And so what I do in the book is look at, okay, what else is happening at this moment? Um, Francis Fukuyama is declaring history over. The Berlin Wall falls the next year. Um, it's the triumphant moment for this end of history idea, this market fundamentalist triumphalism sweeping the world. So all these things that we would have needed to do to respond seriously to this crisis, which means you know, regulating the market, regulating polluters, taxing them, intervening, acting collectively, uh, investing in the public sphere at the very moment when we are privatizing you know, our you know, rail systems, our energy systems. So you know, it, it, it is this case of bad timing because the, the tools we needed to address this crisis um, were sort of taken out of our hands at exactly the worst time. Both the tools, sort of policy tools like regulation, but also even the physical tools, because we were privatizing so much of our energy infrastructure at the very moment when it would have really helped to still have control over it. You know, I, I, I remember that, you know, the, the early 90s when there was still like, a, there, there seemed to be a, a real chance. I mean, I just, I, I 
for, for some reason, it always sticks with me that people were talking, at least in some circles, about sort of recalculating the way that we, or, 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 uh, or trying to recalculate the way that we calculate the GDP, to actually include what we take from the planet as part of that equation uh, on, on the loss ledger. And it just didn't, it just didn't stick at that time. Uh, but, but yeah, it's one of those ideas that, that, that never really goes away, right? Because we know the way we calculate GDP is madness, right? And, and you know, there have been various campaigns around this. You know, economists have to learn to up, uh, subtract. And, you know, I remember the first time I heard that, you know, cleaning up the mess after the Exxon Valdez disaster was actually good for GDP, right? right? I mean, do you remember the first time you heard that? And it's like, wow, this is really screwed up, you know? Um, they even count bad stuff, right? Um, and, and so we know this, that this doesn't work, but I think that, that part of it is that you don't, it, you don't achieve a change that fundamental just because somebody has made a rational argument about it. You actually need social movement power behind it. And that's something the environmental movement is only, has only understood lately, um, uh, you know, in, in the sense that for, you know, really since the, 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 um, the 80s, the environmental movement has been very much about sort of insider lobbying, very professionalized kind of summit hopping, um, which is why that huge climate march in New York um, in September was so significant, you know, not just because it was huge, but because it was a, a, it was it was a people's climate march. It wasn't just a march of the NGOs. It was a march of communities directly impacted by fossil fuel extraction and combustion. And that saw real hope, real economic hope um, in a just transition away from fossil fuels. I want to, I want to, I want to talk about that. The, the sort of um, the neoliberalism that sort of permeates a lot of those traditional, I guess, environmental Groups and the the notion of these these partnerships, and particularly um, about um, the Nature Conservancy, which really sort of blew me away in some respects. But it just it strikes me because you know uh, 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 I, I got a buddy who I, I'm not going to get too far into it, but who we're going to have on uh, tomorrow, who's going to argue that it's the ultimate hubris uh, for us to assume that we can actually change uh, the environment, and it's sort of the the um, uh, the the flip side of the hubris that we thought we could conquer nature on some level. Uh, this guy argues that it's uh, it's hubristic of us to, uh, to to claim that we can we can fix it uh, or at least not damage it uh, in some way. Um, maybe it's not worth spending time on that because that's sort of more uh, that's just one of those arguments I don't think is going to go away and and that's why I think. I mean, you know, it's, it's the funny thing about that argument is that it's almost similar to what you hear from some of the climate deniers, where it's just like, you know, oh, it is. It's, I mean, it's, it's odd, it, right? It, like it's, it, you know, I mean, you hear this. Um, you know, on the one hand, there's the denial that anything is happening, but but then 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 then. Then the next stage is, and even if it were, you know, how crazy would it be to think that we humans could do anything right. um, when really it's all in God's hands, which is bizarre considering, you know, the, the power of this narrative that we were conquering nature all of this time. And also, uh, you know, what we know about the ozone layer. But uh, be that as it may, um, let's, get, uh, let's get to a story about the Nature Conservancy, because, um, you know, and, and you cover this in a, a chapter you call, or I should say a part called Magical Thinking, which um, takes down a lot of um, sort of the neoliberal solutions. We talked to Philip Murawski uh, some time ago, who, who talked about the... the the beauty of neoliberalism is that it creates problems uh, via the market and then comes up with a market-based solution for it. And you talk about, I can't remember the specifics of it, but basically injecting some chemical into the atmosphere that's going to save us and how that's uh, magical. But, but talk about more specifically about the, the Nature Conservancy, because this is, when we talk about who this book is written for, in some ways, uh, this is this is one of those sectors, I guess, that's in the crosshairs. Yeah, I mean, w w 
The issue of bad timing was not just about the fact that our political leaders, um, you know, in, in the period when, when, when we needed them to act on climate change, were in the thralls of this ideology that, they, that they're basically, their job was just to get out of the way of the market. And that was true of Clinton, you know. Um, when, when, when Clinton went to the Kyoto negotiations, um, in, in 1996, um, Clinton and Gore, they insisted that it be embedded in the Kyoto Protocol uh, to respond to climate change and on emission reductions, that there had to be what came to be called the Clean Development Mechanism, which uh, encouraged emission trading. So that there had to be a, a market solutions rather than just straight up regulatory systems. And, and, and that's why Europe has an emission trading system that allows corporations to trade in, in carbon pollution. And it has just been, you know, an epic disaster. Um, the price of carbon has collapsed. It hasn't been an, uh, a disincentive to build more coal fired power plants. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's all, then there's all, all of these sort of uh, it, it carbon offsetting going on, which is another shell game. And so we have tried to come up with market-based solutions to deal with climate change, and they have failed spectacularly. But this is not just the fault of government. It's also because in the 1980s, when you had this political shift, a lot of green groups decided that they were going to get with the program. Um, and this was a response to the fact that uh, the, Re the Reagan administration was sort of virulently anti-environment and sent a very clear message that you know if these groups continued to push for what they called command and control regulation, then they would essentially be exiled out of the halls of power. And these groups had gotten pretty used to their political access. And and um, and so a, a group like um, you know EDF is a great example of this, the Environmental Defense Fund. I know you asked me about the Nature Conservancy, and I will get to this. Um, but EDF is a great example because. Because you know, in in the 70s, their slogan was "Sue the bastards," um, and they had this very confrontational uh, stance with polluters. They were inspired by Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, and they were you know real troublemakers. Um, but in the 80s, in response to the rise of neoliberalism, they um, they rebranded themselves as the environmental group that was willing to go, enter into partnerships with polluters. And, and their new m motto was create markets for the bastards. You know, that was an unofficial motto, but that comes from um, one of the vice presidents of EDF, Eric Pooley. And so the idea was just to convince corporations that it's in their financial interest, you know, to do right by the environment and so on. Um, the, the Nature Conservancy is um, it's the largest environmental group in the world. Um, and um, in, in this same period, they also loosened their, their rules and, 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 and said, you know, well, when, when we conserve land, we don't want to be anti-business, but there can still be some business going on. There could even be some oil drilling. There could even be some, you know, subdivision building. There could even be some mining going on. So they really, they really loosened the definition of what conservation is. Um, and so I discovered in my research um, that, that this had gone so far that they had actually, on a piece of land that had been donated to them, in Texas in order to preserve, it was, it was donated to them by mobile, now Exxon mobile, um, uh, to, uh, because this piece of land was the last remaining breeding grounds for one of the most endangered birds on the planet called the Atwater's Prairie Chicken. Um, and um, so they created this conservation land to save this endangered bird. Um, and, um, and then it turned out that they decided to make some money by drilling for gas on this piece of land. Um, and um, what I discovered in my research is, is that despite the fact that this had been discovered a decade ago and they had promised to no longer uh, to do this kind of thing and change their policies, they are still drilling um, on this piece of land, still profiting from it. Now they're drilling for oil. They've drilled a new How do they justify well. that? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I've had many back and forths with the Nature Conservancy, and they claim that their lawyers have told them that they um, that they don't have a choice; they can't get out of the contract. They've tried. Um, I, you know, I can't say how hard they've tried. And the reason why, you know, I don't let them off the hook is because I think, you know, if this was just about one oil well in Texas, that would be one thing. And it is shocking for an environmental group to be profiting from, from the drilling of, you know, of, of fossil fuels in, an, in, the, in the climate change era. But, but, but that, this is emblematic of the fact that many of these groups 
um, have uh, have really gotten into bed with the fossil fuel sector, maybe not as literally as the Nature Conservancy by drilling for oil themselves, but they take money from fossil fuel companies. They have fossil fuel executives on their boards of directors. And the solutions, the so-called solutions that these groups, many of these groups have systematically advanced to deal with climate change have been ones that conveniently enough um, are least threatening to polluters. It's least threatening to push for emission trading instead of straight up regulation. It's less threatening to um, push for carbon offsetting as opposed to cutting to, to shutting down uh, uh, pollution at source, which the Nature Conservancy has consistently done. And then a lot of these groups, including the Nature Conservancy and the Environmental Defense Fund, have very actively kind of greenwashed fracking, um, much to the dismay of more grassroots environmental groups that are dealing with the impacts at the local level. Uh, so EDF and, and the Nature Conservancy you know, work with oil and gas companies to develop the sort of best practices, you know, ways of making fracking supposedly safe without, you know, really asking the question, you know, is this possible? Is it possible to, uh, you know, to engage in such a destructive practice um, uh, and have it not be a threat to local aquifers? Uh, so, you know, that's why I go after the Nature Conservancy, not just because of this one oil well in Texas, which is noteworthy, and the New York Times reported on it um, uh, uh, actually before the book came out, but crediting the, the book they saw an early copy. Um, but, you know, because it tells us something about their priorities right. and, and, and the broader problem of them pushing these policies that have big picture uh, damaging impacts. So I want to talk about um, I want to talk about uh, the the activism and and, and sort of how we get to uh, what what your um, um, what you know this connection this bridge between sort of having to really sort of make some wholesale changes uh, if we're going to effectively um, a deal or at least uh, diminish the impacts of, of, of climate change. But I, the, I want to do so through one critique. I mean, the most interesting critique to me of your book that I, that I read was by a guy named Michael Hoekstra, who was writing, uh, or Hoekster, I should say, uh, who was writing at the New Economic Perspectives, who was, who was critiquing your, um, the, the sort of the, the, the path forward, I guess, um, from a modern monetary theory perspective, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but uh, it's essentially the notion that um, we have to fund the development of sustainable uh, practices by uh, taking money, essentially, from the, the fossil fuel industry, as opposed to, uh, because of our monetary system, actually just, we can go out there and just spend the money. Now, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to get too deep into uh, the intricacies of that, but, but, but tell me your perspective. I don't know if you've, you've read that uh, critique. But you know, it, I've been meaning to read it, um, and I haven't read it yet. Well, it's um, essentially based on just that notion that I said, that essentially yeah. that because of our fiat-based monetary system... Yeah, we can just spend the money, yeah. Yeah, we could just theoretically spend the money, and I think the, 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 yeah. the, the broader Yeah, because I spend is, a fair bit of time in the book sort of addressing this sense of, you know, like there's this sense of, well, we're broke, we can't do this, you know, because there's a real helplessness that, that you know, post-2008 financial crisis, post-bailing out the banks and, and, and sort of the, the mindset of austerity, people feel like just really hopeless about the, the, the kind of big investments that this would that that this crisis requires you know we have to invest massively in public transit we have to invest massively in a new energy grid you know and all we hear from our politicians is how broke we are so i do i lay out in the book like, okay well how, here's where we can get the money you know we could have a financial transaction tax we could we could increase royalties significantly we could introduce a luxury tax um and and you know i, I and I, I understand the point and i've seen it elsewhere that you know we, we don't even have to do any of this you know when the banks were in crisis we just printed money. Why don't we just do that, right? right? Um, uh, you know, that, th th I think the point, the point I'm making is that we actually need responses that tackle inequality at the same time. Um, and, um, you know, and that's because a, a system with, 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 over, with so much overconsumption fuels the crisis. So I think we do need to take money away from fossil fuel companies as well as invest in the alternatives because the fossil fuel companies have us hurtling down the wrong road. 
right? Um, and, you know, that's why we need all kinds of strategies, whether it's divestment, whether it's stopping the Keystone XL pipeline, whether it's slapping higher royalty rates on them, or whether it's passing anti-fracking moratoriums. We need to find ways to get in the way of the fossil fuel extraction frenzy that we are in the midst of uh, at the moment. Um, as well as invest in the alternatives. And you see this really clearly in Germany, because in Germany, they have just invested in the alternatives, and they have a wonderful policy in place, a feed-in tariff program that has encouraged uh, huge investments uh, in renewable energy. 25% of Germany's electricity now comes from renewable energy. Uh, the, the, the flip side of that is that em Germany's emissions are still going up and have right. gone up for the past couple of years, not by much, but they've still gone up and they haven't gone down by as much as you would expect them to have gone down given this incredible uh, transition to renewable energy. And, and that's because they have not gotten in the way of the coal companies at, at simultaneously. So it's not just enough to invest in what you want. You also have to, you know, seriously restrict what you don't want. And that's what Germany has failed to do. Right. I mean, that's the that's the, the dynamic here. I mean, is the question is like, at what point does, uh, to take Germany for an example, at what point does making uh, renewables so sustain, uh, so viable in the marketplace that it begins to undercut the desire for uh, people to invest in what it's going to take to pull this stuff out of the ground in the future, uh, you know, speaking broadly. And I yeah. think that's, you know, the, so how, so, so the question then becomes like, how do we get to whatever that right mix is? Okay. I mean, the, the tricky thing about sort of imagining that there's just going to be some perfect market solution, right. Is that the fossil fuel companies, you know, have more money than any company in the history of money, as my friend Bill McKibben likes to say, right? And that means they don't just have money to burn, you know, they have money to bribe. So this isn't being left to the market. These are sectors that are tremendously subsidized, right. um, and they have uh, undue influence over the political process. And anybody who wants to, you know, get a reminder of that needs look no further than Mary Landrieu's, you know, speeches of <laughs> the last few days, where she has led um, for the poor Keystone XL pipeline um, because she sees it as a key to saving her political career. Um, and she's, you know, speaking directly to her donors um, and also, you know, trying to safeguard not just her political future, which, you know, looks pretty, uh, you know, Damn. looks pretty unlikely she's going to win re-election. But let's face it, she's also um, setting herself up for her post uh, political career, uh, which may be as an oil and gas lobbyist. So if, cynical. If, I know, I'm so cynical. <laughs> but the point is, is, you know, we're not dealing with a fair system. Um, so the idea that we're just going to have the right market mechanism and that's going to put fossil fuel companies out of business and we can avoid the messy business of actually taking them on directly and building a mass movement and changing the system, you know, I don't buy it. I think it is going to take that kind of, of movement. And, and so, I mean, how do we get there? I mean, because, um, I, you know, it's the it's I guess it's to make people understand uh, just simply aware of the fact that hey look this is going to revolve this is going to require a you know wholesale change in your life uh, yeah I th but I think that the really key part of getting there I think is spending a lot more time um, linking uh, climate action with economic justice and talking about how we can design a transition away from fossil fuels that is going to address many of the other crises that we are collectively facing. You know, when I've been talking about this book over the last few months, the line that always gets like the biggest laugh in whatever audience I'm talking to is when I say, you know, it's not like we're dealing with an economic system whose only problem is rising sea levels, right? At which point people just crack up because everybody knows that this system is broken on so many other levels, right? So I think it's when we act, and this is the problem with how siloed our political system is, you know, that, that you know, as we were talking about earlier, you know, that the, that the environment people or the climate people don't talk to the, the, to the economic justice people, don't talk to the trade people, et cetera, right? Is that if we can design a really holistic response that shows people that this is going to be, this can deliver um, 
uh, much better public services than they have right now, um, that you know, they can have ownership over their energy, that they can have more local democracy. This is you know, being called the energy democracy movement in, in Germany. So it isn't just about switching to renewables. It's about the fact that you know, much of this transition in Germany has only happened because in hundreds of cities and towns, people have voted to take back ownership over their electricity grids, have started energy cooperatives. And that means that the energy they're generating when it's profitable, the communities keep the profits and they use it to fund their schools and they use it you know, to, to deliver public transit and better services. So we need to talk about what a just transition would look like, how it would deliver a better, fairer economy than the one we have right now. Um, and, you know, and how we, we need to prioritize justice in, in the sense that the communities that have been on the front lines um, of, of the worst parts of our extractive economy, because their kids have asthma, because they are dealing with cancer clusters, um, you know, because their land has been torn up by extraction, those communities should be on the uh, first in line uh, to benefit from, from the transition. The reason why we need to build a movement like that, that is not just a climate movement, but is a climate justice movement, is because people will fight for that. It, because it is not about sacrifice in the name of some far off good. It's about uh, creating a better present right now. And um, you know, we are up against forces that have a whole lot to lose, right? We're talking about fossil fuel companies that you know, have trillions of dollars in, in fossil fuel and carbon reserves that you know, if we take climate change seriously, they will have to forego. They're going to fight like they mean it. And so far, so far, climate change has always been this issue that, you know, progressives and liberals care about, but it's sort of, you know, at the bottom of the list after everything else. What needs to be built is a movement that, ha that, that has those day-to-day -day needs, jobs, healthcare, transit at its center so that people will fight for it, not just against, you know, their fear of rising sea levels down the road, but fighting for that better future right now. So what is that? I mean, you know, because as you talk about that sort of taking over the local control, the first thing that comes to my mind is Denton, Texas, mm -hmm. where they um, uh, I spoke to an activist there over the summer and they were uh, pushing for this um, uh, city ordinance, basically saying, I mean, it, the, the images of Denton, Texas are just crazy. And the stories yeah, in there are just crazy. Absolutely. If people haven't heard, there's like fracking. It's like where your uh, local 7-Eleven is downtown. That's where there's fracking wells. Uh, and there are kids. I mean, it's it's just so destructive for that community. They passed an ordinance saying, like, can't do this yeah. here. And literally the next day, uh, yeah. they are the city is sued in a way that, you know, they're claiming they have a fund to, to fight it. But the amount of money that's just going to get poured into that uh, suit is going to bankrupt the town. Uh, I mean, so what, what what is the what is the policy prescription of, of, of that nexus look like? In other words, is it in New York State, we should be spending X millions of dollars on developing, you know, uh, uh, solar manufacturing or, 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 or some type of wind, uh, renewable energy and getting the unions yeah, to I buy mean, into that? This is where the anti-fracking movement is at right now where, um, you know, I think there is this realization that there's only so far you can go with just or no, right? I mean, the, the, the real solution is don't let yourself get turned into Denton in the first place, right? I mean, right. It's, it's hugely significant that Denton um, voted in the way that it did. This is, you know, Republican, you know, place. This, you know, shows that, that you know, at the local level, this can cross political boundaries. Um, and, and I think that, that, that there needs to be a strategy for, to, um, to, to, to provide financial support for that, you know, really key battle, um, you know, because, because it's, you know, it, it, sometimes you have these legal battles, you know, that are about much, something much bigger than, than, than one individual place. So it's important that they win. And, you know, I think they will be able to raise a lot more money than they already have right now because people understand the stakes of that particular battle. But more broadly, it's interesting to look at the anti-fracking movement and what people like Sandra Steingraber and Josh Fox are doing now, which is, yeah, they're, they are still fighting fracking and they are still fighting, you know, new 
expansions of 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 gas infrastructure storage facilities pipelines but they're also pushing um, the research that's come out of Stanford University from Mark Jacobson and his team that shows that we can uh, get to 100% renewable energy. They've broken it down state by state. They have a New York specific plan that shows how New York can get to 100% renewables. And we need to do these two things at once. We need to say no to the infrastructure that locks us into unconventional fossil fuels for decades to come that are higher emissions, you know, because fracking has higher methane leakage and tar sands is three times more energy intensive than conventional uh, oil. So we need to do that. We still need to fight the Keystone X cells and we still need to fight fracking, but we also need to show that getting to 100% renewables is possible, not just possible, but preferable on all these levels. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to build in living wage requirements so that, you know, the jobs are good and this is, uh, um, you know, dignified work and, and, um, and, and so that people will fight for it, as I said earlier. Another piece of this that I think is really key is, you know, I've never understood why the environmental movement doesn't spend more time uh, just on public transit, because this is right. you know, a pub- public infrastructure that creates jobs and directly benefits people's lives and helps low-income people most of all. And everywhere you look, the price of, of, of public transit is going up, services are going down. It is a climate solution, but it's one that really concretely bridges economic and racial justice. Um, so why aren't we fighting for 100% free public transit as they are in Brazil. You know, they rioted for that ahead of the World Cup, you know, Um, and yet nobody ever called that a climate demonstration. I thought it was a climate demonstration, even if they never use the word climate. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you just see those images of uh, of people in Japan taking a 300 mile per hour uh, train and just wonder why we can't get those type of things here. Or even even contemplate it. All right. Well, so Naomi, well, and that's because ultimately, Sam, you know, and this is why, you, you know, it, the fact that we can't even contemplate it indicates the extent to which this this is about the need for a real battle of worldviews, of values, of of ideology, um, and we shifted very far in one direction over the past thirty years, and we need to shift back. Let me ask you in closing, and I know the answer to this, but I think it's important for people to hear because <laughs> I don't want, uh, you know, the, uh, too often this program gets a little bit depressing. Uh, but, uh, but are you optimistic, and what should we look, you know, having, you know, I know that uh, we have uh, in December in Paris of next year, yeah. uh, we have these big talks. Is that what we should be looking towards, or, or should we stop looking for these sort of, institutional markers and rather sort of, you know, get more into a day-to-day mode? Well, I know, I think we need, you know, as usual, we need to do it all at the same time, but I definitely don't think we can pour, it makes sense to pour all political energy into this idea that, you know, there's a UN negotiation coming up in Paris in 2015 and, you know, everything hinges on that. I think it's much more important to push forward with what a climate, a real climate justice-based climate response would look like wherever it is that we live. Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit, a little bit about what that looks like in New York um, and the people who are already working on that. Go to, go to the website solutions.org um, to, to, you know, to look at that 100% renewable plan for New York. Um, and, and to get concrete, I mean, one of the things that you know, we're trying to do with this project, we've got a film coming out related to it in a couple of months, is bring people into the same room you know, who are you know, in the trade union movement and in the climate movement um, and really hash out what a, a just transition would look like um, you know, across the, these barriers that you know, often divide us. Because we need to have that vision of climate action ahead of that summit. We need to know what it is we're fighting for. I mean, too often it's just been this idea of, you know, we want action and sort of begging political leaders to take action. And that gives them, frankly, too much power to decide what the action should be. Uh, maybe for them, you know, it's, it's nuclear or more fracking, and that's what we're seeing. Um, so, you know, we have to be specific about what, what kind of action we want. And I think that that is best workshopped on the ground. And, and that's the exciting moment where in is that the technologies are ready for prime time and we are at this exciting moment where you can see you know germany 25 percent of their energy coming from renewables you know this is not you know a fantasy anymore we can do this um and you know it has to be rolled out 
Naomi Klein, you're a uh, hemispheric uh, treasure uh, from Canada. Thank you, Sam. So we, uh, the, the, the book is This Changes Everything. Of course, we'll link to it at um, uh, majority.fm. Uh, Naomi, thanks so much for taking the time. So good talking with you. Right, Take bye. care.